we're as optimistic about uh, Bitcoin as we ever have been, um, but there were there are a few regulatory and tax uncertainties, uh, and uh, we had been waiting for the discount uh, between uh, GBTC and NAV to to narrow. It was as high as 50 percent at one point last year when there was great uncertainty around all of the turmoil in crypto generally, and now. It's a single digit. Uh, and there are now other products out there that uh, we can use to gain exposure to Bitcoin in this moment. And it's just a moment of uncertainty between now, we think, and um, January, January 8th to 10th, somewhere in that range, perhaps. Uh, but we, out of an abundance of caution, didn't want to take any risk. Mm -hmm. And I mean, let's get a little bit specific here because we're talking about the ARK Next Generation Internet ETF. The ticker there is ARK W. And I think what caught a lot of people's attentions is that you uh, completely sold down your remaining stake of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Instead, on the same day, uh, you bought into the ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF. Of course, that tracks uh, Bitcoin futures. It doesn't actually hold the physical Bitcoin. Can you explain that shuffle? What was the thinking there? Sure. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, um, BIDO, the ProShares, is already approved. There's no regulatory uncertainty having to do with it. Uh, uh, so we chose to maintain our exposure through BIDO uh, for the time being. And uh, as I mentioned before, there are some uh, tax and regulatory uncertainties still as part of this process. Uh, we don't know exactly who's going to be approved and uh, uh, and whether they've met all the uh, criteria that the SEC has put before us. Uh, we know we have, uh, but uh, we don't know if others, including GBTC, have. We just, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so again, out of an abundance of caution. And GBT's discount, again, it was as much as 50 percent relative to NAV. So not only have we enjoyed this year the run in Bitcoin itself, but We've had the nice closing of that discount. So it's been, uh, you know, double good news for us. But you've talked about January 10th, Kathy, I think in another report. Is that possible, whether it's you or somebody else, in terms of the first um, spot Bitcoin ETF actually getting approval? Uh, well, we think the probabilities have gone up because the SEC has been highly engaged compared to what was happening before. Before, it was just denying approval, denying approval. Uh, and we just kept putting our uh, filing in again, you know, try, and <laughs> try, 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 you know. Yeah dogged and determined. And uh, so here we are. We think we're, we're first in line, and that's why there is this uh, January 10th deadline. Um, but we like the idea that the SEC has been so engaged, and it's not just with us, it's others as well. We think a number of uh, uh, a number of funds could be approved at the same time. Uh, and they've been asking not only one set of questions, but follow-up questions. And uh, again, that's a very good sign. Well, speaking of and, engaged, oh, go ahead, please. No, 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 yeah, The last few questions have been very technical. Mm. And uh, uh, and so more de rigueur and, you know, you'd expect them to be asking these questions as we head toward an approval. Now, it's not 100 percent certain. And uh, so we want to make that clear as well. Um, this is the SEC and uh, we never know, you know, what might happen along the way. Regulators can be tricky, that's for sure. Hey, listen, you mentioned engagement. Let's talk about engagement with your funds overall and especially the ARK Innovation Fund, up 72 percent year to date, easily outperforming uh, some of the major major uh, market benchmarks, still down 65 percent from the high back in February of 2021. For you, though, a lot of critics. We bring up your name, we bring up ARC, and you have a lot of fans and you have a lot of critics. There's a lot of discussion. Does it feel, though, a little bit like a victory lap this year? Uh, well, you know, we are very happy that a couple of things have happened. Uh, that this idea that interest rates were going to continue moving higher uh, has been proven incorrect. And uh, I think even the Fed, while there is that small possibility, even the Fed is now starting to talk about the other side of the interest rate move. And so I, I do believe all we've seen so far is a reaction to that macro phenomenon or, or judgment call. Um, we went through our, our uh, flagship strategy and all of our strategies 
countries went through a very difficult time from February 21 through December of 22 as interest rates, first of all, were presumed uh, to move up or forecasted mm -hmm. to move up. And then when they did move up, so it was almost like a double discounting. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen the first installment of um, the the uh, the correction there to the upside for our funds uh, with this notion. And it's, again, the forecast that interest rates will come down. And, you know, we, we would presume that if they do come down, uh, for the reasons we think they're going to come down, m the most important one being deflation, then our funds will uh, be in good shape because we are very, uh, our, our companies uh, thrive on deflation. Technologically enabled innovation is deflationary. So, Kathy, a very good morning to you. It's Manus, first time we, we've met on. Uh, so we're going to move to a deflationary environment. We'll come back to the big macro call in a moment. Just let's square it away before I talk to you about the flows in the funds, which is is how much interest rate cuts do you presume are you forecasting? Leave the forecasts of everybody else aside. What do you, what do you presume will happen next year? Well, we put up a chart uh, in one of our in the no in the nose, which is a, a YouTube video that I do every every month, Employment Friday, and in that chart you will find uh, a, a, a ratio. It's the metals uh, to gold ratio, mm -hmm. so metals price to gold price. Uh, and there has been an extremely tight correlation between that ratio and long-term interest rates. In October, we, we published it, or early November, mm -hmm. and what you will see is that there was a very wide gap that had developed. The metals to gold ratio was near its low for the past 12, 15 years, and interest rates were at their highs, uh, 5%. The correlation, if you just eyeballed that chart, the correlation suggested that rates should go to 2%. Now, now, maybe they won't go all the way to 2%, but we think that long-term interest rates are way above where they're going to okay. end up because of deflation. Okay, yes. well, let's, we'll come back to that and see whether we get to the 2% level. I've got to ask you about the flows into the funds, which is obviously, you know, as Carol just said, you, you've got a bit of a victory lap going on at the moment, but this is the first year of outflows. Um, have those outflows stopped? You've had a great performance in the back part of this year. Have the outflows stopped? Um, and has that bleed? stopped. Yes, well, we were very gratified at our asset retention in 21 and 22. Um, in fact, we had net inflows, if you combine both years, of more than $18 billion. Uh, and this year, uh, one w might expect uh, that those who averaged down into the, the very steep declines that we were seeing in 22 especially, uh, might take some profits. So we have had, uh, I know for our flagship strategy, it's um, roughly $500 million in outflows. Maybe for all of our strategies, $1.8 million. So maybe 10% of the inflows that we enjoyed during 21 and 22. So again, we're very gratified and grateful to our, our clients for uh, the support that we continue to receive. So has the, has the outflow stopped? Uh, we have had uh, days of, on balance, very recently, yes. Uh, and I think part of this is many people do uh, uh, tax management toward the end of the year. And so some of the outflows might have been associated with, uh, uh, with uh, clients who um, got in at a high cost base and were just harvesting okay. some tax losses. But I think we're through that. Is, do you find it a little surprising, though, Kathy, considering the run-up? Or do you... I'm curious about the conversations you do have with investors considering the year that you're having and then to see those flows. It's got to be a yes, little disheartening. You know, yeah. Oh, no, 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 not at all. A actually, we put out a piece for uh, Resolute, our distributor, who, um, and, and we basically showed to, uh, them, if you rebalance our strategy when there have been big moves one way or the other, if you rebalance regularly or based on a rule like uh, when, when the fund's up 15% relative to everything else, take some profits. And what uh, it showed, that study showed that if you are disciplined that way, that um, over any rolling five-year uh, period, um, 
it is highly likely, uh, almost uh, 100%, I'm not quite sure if it's quite that high, but uh, that, uh, uh, that you will beat the market, uh, meaning as measured by the NASDAQ or the S&P, over a rolling five-year period. And so uh, a lot of our funds are with advisors who are very sophisticated and uh, responded somewhat, perhaps in this tax, tax management uh, part of the year, to that message. I feel like we can't talk, we have to talk about Tesla and Elon Musk. And I know you just had a conversation on Twitter X. Um, this has been, I think, from day one, right, in terms of you starting out, that you've had this investment in Tesla. And I remember when we first talked and you were getting started, you talked about him being the next Thomas Edison he, and how his vehicles would turn the U.S. economy upside down. Um, having said that, there's an evolution and the EV world has changed. How are you thinking? It's still a top holding. How are you thinking about the Tesla story right now? Well, um, first of all, Carol, thank you very much for letting me interview that mm -hmm. time. That was nearly 10 years ago. Arquette is about to celebrate his 10th year anniversary, and you gave us that opportunity, so thank you. Um, uh, the world is evolving, actually, um, uh, I, I think, even m more closely to what we expected. Uh, because we expected a lot of traditional auto manufacturers to see the writing on the wall and rush as quickly as they could into scaling big time into electric vehicles. And what has happened recently? Both GM and Ford have said, uh, we're stepping back. Uh, it, we're not going to do this until uh, it's profitable. The problem with that is in order to be profitable, they need to scale. That's how this works. These are learning curves that they are uh, riding down, and those are expressed in cost declines. So the fact that they're pulling back means they're more sh there's more share for Tesla and others who choose to go for it. Mm. And, uh, Kathy, I want to keep the conversation going on Elon Musk, but I want to bring it to the ARK Venture Fund. And of course, uh, it's not an ETF. You invest in private companies, et cetera, in there. And you take a look at the portfolio. You have SpaceX in there. And you also have X, formerly known as Twitter. And in July, you had told the Wall Street Journal that you had written down your Twitter stake by 47%. Fill us in on the past couple of months. Have you written it down further, or how has that changed? No, I think it's uh, still there. Um, you know, uh, we have to be very careful. This is an interval fund. It is a 40-act fund. And we have to mark to market every day. Uh, the good news is our clients can get in and have access to these amazing companies for just $500, and they get quarterly liquidity. So, so that's the good news. The markdowns are simply, you know, if we see in the secondary market employee stock trading at a steep discount, Discount, we have to take that into account. If we see others in the more traditional asset management work, world, like uh, Fidelity and others, uh, marking their holdings down, uh, we need to take that into consideration during our daily mark to market. So it's an abundance of caution. We have a five year investment time horizon. Do mm -hmm. we think that's where? X belongs in terms of valuations? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. A roughly 20-ish billion dollar uh, valuation for what we believe truly will become uh, the everything app, think WeChat Pay. Uh, Elon started his entrepreneurial career in the payments industry, and he's been thinking about this for a long time. He now has money transmitter licenses in more than half of all of the states, mm -hmm. uh, which we learned on Twitter spaces or on X spaces, I should say, uh, the other day when we had our interview with him. So that's exciting. He's going for it. He's going for it. Uh, we'll see if that one lands. But let's talk a little bit more about the private markets because obviously the private credit market has gotten a lot of attention right now. You're looking at the private markets through this interval fund that you have. When you think about the opportunities there on that five-year horizon that you have, do you see more so in the public markets or in the private markets right now? Uh, well, uh, now that we've had this very nice run this year, um, we think the answer to that question is in the private markets. They're close. They're close. What's fascinating to us is that the public markets have been leading the private markets for the past three years. As our funds were, uh, were falling in 21, uh, private 
evaluations were going to all-time highs along with the NASDAQ. They were taking their cues, I suppose, from the NASDAQ. But real innovation, if you looked at our portfolios, uh, was starting to um, revalue to the downside, and even more so in 2022. We are still seeing major down rounds taking place in the private markets. And I'm always surprised at, at this sort of thing because you would think that the private markets lead the public markets. That has not been the case in the last few years. Hey, Kathy, I've got to be honest with you. I think whenever we think about Elon Musk, brilliant, but also erratic. And I'm curious how you think about Elon, the individuals versus Elon, the companies he's creating, the things he's doing. Because I think if there is time, any other CEO of a major publicly held company would, I think it's safe to say, not be able to get away with a lot of what he has done. So help us educate us how you make sense of it, of someone you have followed, talked with for many years. Well, first of all, uh, very often we just look at what he does, not exactly what he's saying, which can often be a distraction, or it can be an advertisement for his cars or for X or or for SpaceX uh, and so forth. So, um, But we have a, a scoring system um, as we are evaluating companies and their founders and their management teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are six metrics, and one of them is moat and barriers to entry. And mm -hmm. uh, I think Elon is a maestro of raising barriers to entry with innovation, which that is so much faster than anyone else. Why? Because he's so first principles, physics driven in his uh, analysis of how to approach a new idea, a so, big idea. So tell me this then, Kathy. I mean, if you look at the cohort of, yours, of, of the CEOs that you back, Brian Armstrong, does he hit that bar? Does he... Does, is he above Elon or is he at the money? You've got Elon, you've got Brian, you've got uh, Tony Wood at Roku. Um, does anybody come close to Elon or is Brian Armstrong maybe even at the money with, with, with Elon or above? Well, uh, we don't actually look at uh, the world that way, one relative to the other in terms of management teams. We do look from our scoring system at the scores, which include moat, management, people and culture, execution, valuation, that might surprise people, and uh, product and service leadership and thesis risk. Those are the six scores. And uh, both, but, but, well, all three of them score very highly. Which one scores the highest? I, they are actually very close to one another, to be honest. They're very close to one another. So, I mean, obviously, Coinbase uh, is one of your, your key holdings. We've talked a little bit about that. The, the, other, the other feature that we want to talk about is AI. Um, I'm curious to know, in OpenAI, uh, the valuations have ranged between 80 billion to 100 billion. Will you take a position in OpenAI? Is that going to be part of, of your holdings as you explore the next development of AI in your holdings? Well, um, in our uh, private portfolios, we uh, are already exposed to Anthropic, which has been a major beneficiary of the drama around OpenAI that uh, we all witnessed uh, a few months ago. Um, but if you look at GPT-4, which is uh, the latest large language model that, uh, that OpenAI has published, it is uh, way above others in terms of performance. So there you have it, the, the, the pros and the cons. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't tell you what we're going to do in that portfolio, but uh, we are so impressed at how OpenAI has led the industry. We're also impressed, however, at the open source models, and, and we'd like to encourage more of that movement. Uh, we know that Meta Platforms, has, has with Llama 2 and uh, it's working on others, is moving very quickly and uh, making great strides. So for much lower cost, uh, open source is free, uh, companies can get close, not, not, not yeah. uh, right at, at GPT-4, but close. So we want to see the open source movement. In in the venture fund, we also own... Um, Kathy, we've got to... We, we, oh, sorry. No, no, no. We, we never have enough time with you. Can I ask you a really quick question? Five seconds. Sure. Any sure, new sure. ETFs coming our way from you guys next year? 
Well, uh, real quickly, uh, as you may know, we bought a company in London. Yeah, uh, they have some very interesting funds. 